Well, welcome everybody to another one of our educational sessions here at Level Financial. I'm Mike Hebron, the Chief Operating Officer with Level Financial. And tonight we are doing one of our annual educational sessions on uh, Medicare. Uh, it's basically Medicare 101, the do's and don'ts of Medicare. And I'm pleased tonight to have with us again, um, Tammy Nash, who is our um, expert here that we work with on Medicare. Before I introduce Tammy, just a couple of ground rules about our webinar tonight. First of all, there is a Q&A uh, function on the webinar. So if you have a question in the middle of the webinar that you want answered, feel free to put that in there. We'll repeat the question to Tammy at, at the appropriate time, and then we can have her um, answer the question for you live. If you would like Tammy to reach out to you after this webinar so you can ask her specific questions about your situation, we invite you to text the word Medicare to our text line, which is 716-727-5047. We'll give you that number again later, but if you text the word Medicare to that line, you'll get a response from us. We'll make sure that Tammy gets your information and then she will reach out to you um, and uh, see what you're um, see what you're looking for. So um, let me introduce Tammy. So Tammy is a licensed insurance benefit coordinator with Sable Insurance Agency, where she has specialized in Medicare insurance for 26 years. She is born and raised in Buffalo, lives uh, locally here in Amherst with her four children, husband, and three, she says puppies, but they're three dogs, three dogs. Um, and Tammy has been working with Level and our clients for many, many years. We do a lot of work together. In her spare time, which doesn't sound like she has a lot of, she enjoys traveling with her family and photography. So let me turn it over to Tammy. Tammy, let's go through the presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Mike and Level Financial for having me once again this year. It's always a joy. Um, to be here with you folks tonight and for so many years uh, working together. So thank you again. Um, so here we go. We're going to do the Medicare one-on-one -on -one basics, very educational, very, um, you know, going over, like Mike said, the A, Bs, and Cs and Ds of Medicare and general information. Um, of course, if there's questions, like Mike said, you can um, put those in the chat and then we'll certainly get to those at the end of the presentation. So here we go. All right. Um, there's an important disclosure here that we just have on the screen. Um, the following presentation by Level Financial Advisors is intended for general information purposes only. Um, no portion of the presentation serves as a receipt of or as a substitute for personalized investment advice from Level or any other investment professional of your choosing. Please see additional important disclosure at the end of this presentation and a copy of Level's current written disclosure brochures discussing our advisory services and fees is available upon request. All right, so here we go. So what is Medicare? So Medicare, just like I said, it's going to be very general information tonight. Um, we're going to go over the basics, but Medicare is a health insurance for entitled beneficiaries, could be turning 65 or older, under 65 with certain disabilities, or any age of individuals with end-stage renal disease or diagnosed with ALS. The administration of Medicare is the term CMS and it stands for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So any mail that you may receive from CMS, that is definitely very important information to open. So this is always a very important part of the presentation in the beginning is in general, just the enrollment periods at a glance, because this is a lot of the things that people will question, you know, when am I going to be looking for my Medicare, um, I'm still working, et cetera. And these are some general, you know, very important um, points of the initial enrollment period. Um, somebody turning 65 would be three months before your 65th birthday, the month of or three months after somebody's 65th birthday. This is the general time where anybody that is turning 65 can legally sign up for Medicare. Once again, that's three months before, before their 65th birthday, the month of or three months after. 
Um, for individuals that may have been overwhelmed, it's very common that people, you know, are just overwhelmed by the mail that they're receiving during that initial election period of being new to Medicare. And they, they think, oh, I'm still working. Um, I don't, I'm not worried about anything. And they don't really ask factual questions and what they need to do. And they may miss that general enrollment period um, of their initial election period. They then can apply through January 1st of every year, um, through March 31st. But if they do it during that general enrollment period, their Medicare does not begin, Medicare Part B would not begin until July 1st of the same year. In that time frame, if you were not in a, a special election period to waive your Medicare, um, people then will have penalties that will usually apply indefinitely. Um, so we certainly are having these, we have these conversations um, we are doing these, you know, um, PowerPoint presentations and talking to people, so they're not in that position. Um, and that's why we tell you about the initial enrollment period and then what could happen if you miss it, you would fall into that general enrollment period, which, which like I said, is starts January 1st of every year through March. And then that Medicare, though, would not begin till July 1st. Now, some people will fall into a special election period um, where they might not necessarily need to sign up for Medicare in their initial time, which is when they're turning 65. Um, those special election enrollment periods would be for people who are working and covered by a large employer group plan or covered by a working spouse. Large employer group is considered 20 plus employees. Medicare Part B then, if you decide to go into the special enrollment period and then retire and wanna to elect to take your Medicare, um, as long as you have a certain forms filled out to prove um, that you are working with a large group or your spouse was that was covering you, you have an eight month period from your retirement, from when your retirement begins or your spouse um, to sign up for Medicare. So they do give you a window of time. Um, but with that, Medicare Part D, which is the drug plan side, they only give you 63 days from when your retirement begins if you're already enrolled in Medicare Part A. Um, so that special enrollment period is, is used constantly. I work with people every day that do work past 65, and we give them the forms to fill out. Um, those forms to fill out proving that you're with large group would then go to your HR department or a benefits coordinator from the firm or the group to legally fill them out. You cannot fill them out yourselves. And that's when we submit to Medicare or I'm sorry, Social Security to get the Part B active and going. Most of my clients, though, when we're working together, um, once again, you can wait eight months from when retirement begins. Um, you are allowed that, that waiting period, but most people don't do that um, just because the drug plan is only 63 days. And we want to make sure that we're coordinating insurance and there's no real loss of insurance um, for a long period of time. Okay, hold on one second. My little scroller, here we go. So how do we enroll in Medicare? Um, you can, when you're in your initial election period, once again, three months before that 65th birthday, the month of or three months after, you can easily seamlessly do it online through Medicare, or I'm sorry, through socialsecurity.gov. Um, what throws people off, and this is why I accidentally said Medicare, is a lot of people think that they can apply for Medicare benefits through Medicare, but it actually has to start at Social Security. Um, a Social Security site is definitely um, very secure. Um, there is a lot of people that might have went in before 2018 that had started a portal. And then since COVID, um, they have to restart a new portal because those plan, those uh, sites aren't as secure as in the past. So it can cause a little, little stress when people are trying to create a new portal with Social Security. But if people are going in brand new in the, not, in the last two years, um, starting a portal, it's easy to get in and apply for your Medicare that way. Some people don't have um, that opportunity, whether they don't have a computer um, or they just don't feel comfortable doing it that way. You can certainly call, set up an appointment at your local social security office and get in and do it that way. Or you can do a phone call appointment through social security nationally on the phone. Um, but those appointments, whether they're in person 
or over the phone can sometimes take two months to get. So we really try to tell people, you know, if, if you're not going to feel comfortable doing it online or you're not able to, you want to get on the ball quick so you can get that appointment in time. Um, and then we also included the phone um, number here where, like I said, you can set up a phone interview to apply or schedule a visit. Um, last year when we had this seminar, um, and I even think the year before, um, the social security offices were actually closed. Um, since April, most of them have opened up with or without an appointment, but we still encourage people if they're looking to apply for Medicare, just don't show up, actually set that appointment up so you're getting things done the right way. So why would somebody delay? I know, um, you know, people that are working nowadays, working past 65, and just in general, I think, you know, even though we, we are given this information in the mail, and there's so much commercials on the TV about Medicare, people are definitely a little bit more versed about Medicare more than I think ever. I've done this for such a long time. But there is always a big question around nowadays more than ever, if you have a high deductible HSA and you're turning 65 and you still want to work, um, should you still apply for Part A and just waive the B? And that has become a more common topic of conversation as people are working longer and these employers are offering these high deductible plans. And the one Thing that we really stress to people when they're looking at their plan into retirement and um, looking at their benefits at the moment um, and deciding on what they're going to do. The big question we ask now, if you are in health insurance through your employer and you're happy with it, and it is a high deductible um, health savings account plan, a plan do not, if you plan on still working for a, a few more years, do not take part A if you're going to stay employed and um, still want to contribute to that HSA. So if you participate in a high deductible plan and you're in contributing to an HSA, you will not want to enroll in Part B since you are not allowed to participate in another health insurance plan and contribute to HSA. <clears throat> so once again, if you're in a high deductible plan, you're happy with it, you, you want to stay employed, you don't see retirement in the future, then we're going to tell you when you get to this crossroads of being 65, do not then apply for A or B. You're going to stay away from both, and you can do that. Um, in the future, though, if you decide, and it gets, we're going to get into this in the next slide, but in the future, if you decide, okay, now I want to jump into taking my Social Security income, or I want to now retire, you are going to have to plan a little bit better um, if you waive the A initially, but it's considered a tax penalty. It's considered double dipping. You can't contribute to a HSA tax-free and then also take Part A because Part A covers 80% in the hospital and it's considered double dipping. Okay, so this slide gets into it a little bit more. So um, for my, I was starting to get into, you know, if people decide, you know, um, a little while later that they're now going to see retirement in their future, you and you didn't take part A because you were contributing to the HSA, we are advised to tell you, you must seize the HSA contribution once enrolled in Medicare Part A or Part B. If you enroll in Medicare after your initial election period, you must seize contributions six months prior to enrolling in Medicare. Okay, so once again, you don't take Part A, you're still contributing, but two years from now, you set a date. You set the date for the summer of, let's say, 2025. We are going to tell you if you still are contributing to the HSA, you are going to want to stop contribution if you're planning for the summer, probably in the new year. So you're six months out from contributing. So you do not have any tax penalties. Any contributions made after enrollment are not tax deductible and may be subject to a tax penalty. You may continue to spend on that existing HSA fund for qualified medical expenses. So if you stop that contribution and you have, let's say, $6,000 in that HSA account, you can still use that HSA. You just no longer can contribute once you take the A. 
If enrolling in Medicare mid-year, your contribution limit will be reduced by the number of months out of the year you are enrolled in Medicare. So enrolling in Medicare continued. So why would I delay enrolling in Medicare Part B? So if you are continuing to work for your company after the age 65 and you have health insurance through your employer, you will not have to enroll in Medicare Part B. This is as long as your employer group is larger than 20 employees. Most Medicare eligibles will not want to pay an extra premium to Medicare and to a group health insurance program. So I know like once again, you know, where a lot of calls come in and where, where I deal with people every day and I know Level does the same thing where they, they have these conversations with their clients is, you know, you'll get inundated with all the solicitation sometimes six months before your 65th birthday, whether it's by phone, the TV, the mail. And people question, you know, everybody's telling me I have to take it, but I'm still employed. Well, if you're once again, the, the, the golden number here is 20 employees. If you're still employed and there's 20 people or more in the group, then you don't necessarily have to jump on the Medicare train. You can absolutely wait. And let me say this too, it doesn't, you can have 30 people in the group and that's what they file with New York State, but only 10 people opt to take the insurance. It's by what they file with New York State, the number of bodies in the group that they file with New York State that matters with that number. There is some confusion around that at times. Um, but if you are a, a still working and with, or you or your spouse is still working and that group is less than 20 employees, it is advised to take Medicare Part B when eligible. If you do not take the Part B when eligible, then you'll be subject to that 10% penalty per year, which once again, all the time this happens where people get just bad advice or they're overwhelmed and they kind of ignore things and it's not intentional, it just happens. And that's where those individuals that are still working and they're happily employed and they have no desire to retire and they're getting group insurance and they think, well, why would I do anything? Why, why you know, change something that doesn't need to be changed? But there is this golden rule. And if your business is just under 20, it could be, you know, 19, you still will have to take that Medicare. And if you don't, then what can happen is down the line, it doesn't sometimes happen right away, but whatever group insurance plan you're in, eventually when you go to the doctors, you go in the hospital, the claims go through to that insurance company and the insurance company is going to say, wait a minute, this individual is showing that they should have Medicare. They're in a small group plan and they didn't take Medicare. So guess what? we're not going to pay the claims. And we've had some friction with that. We've had that happen to people. And we've had people call us about that. Oh my goodness, I referred to you because of this happened. And what do I do? And sadly, some of those people are, are out of their initial election period and they cannot then sign up until for Medicare until January of that next year or in that year. And it doesn't start till the next you know, July. So those individuals get caught in this really scary web and it can really be serious. So I will say, you know, in my last five years, I've seen more insurance companies um, really look, um, they've really been auditing a lot of the people in, in their ages by looking for people that are getting close to 65 and sending them letters and giving them the rules in these letters and saying, you know, have you applied for Medicare? Because if you don't, this could happen. Um, so we have been seeing that a lot more with, you know, insurance companies really being more vigilant about that. So that does not happen, but it can. So we always just want people to check, you know, I, I see um, where a lot of um, employees will get in seasonal type of positions or they're with these businesses that are smaller and they have a lot of seasonal employees and those can waver um, in the summer months, in the winter months, and that number can waver. So I always tell my clients, you know, go to whoever is in charge of the insurance in that business and have them check with the insurance company and how many people they filed that year. So we can make sure if you need to apply for Medicare, we're doing it the right way. We're not guessing. So that, those are really important for, I, I've seen the seasonal type of um, employees. So uh, we have a question. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, this question came in and, and it is, uh, does my monthly Medicare payment mm -hmm. get taken from my husband's social security because we file jointly? No. Um, in, so if, so if, 
so if I heard the correct question correctly, um, we have, you know, two individuals or an individual that is of Medicare eligibility um, is going to take Medicare. And of course, there's a payment for that. But because you're under the husband's, is it going to come out of his Social Security check? It does not. You, you are individuals in Medicare. So if you um, have your own personal, you know, Social Security account, it's going to come from your check. Um, or if you're not collecting yet, it is going to be billed to you quarterly, which we're actually going to get into in the in the um, seminar. But it, no, you're you're completely individual. It's going to come out of your Social Security check that's given to you. Does that answer that? Yep, I think that uh, that answers the question. No other questions at this at this point. Okay. Okay, bear with me because a little cursor, I'm not used to it. Um, okay, so this is the Medicare card. Um, this is that, that card that everybody always questions and wonders what it looks like in most cases. A um, couple years ago, um, before the year 2018, that Medicare card looked like this, except for it would have that individual social security number, or if you were taking your husband's benefit, it would have his social security number, and then it would have the A and the B, the dates, and then a signature. So they finally came up to the times and said, boy, we're putting social security numbers on a card that's given quite often um, or in your wallet very freely with a signature on it. This could be a real issue. So back in 2018, they revamped the cards. Um, anybody that had Medicare prior to 2018 got all new cards and anybody new coming into Medicare had new cards and they now will have your personal name, a special identification number, which once again, your spouse, even if you're using his social security income, you both have separate numbers, totally individual in Medicare. And then they've taken the signature off the card. The one thing that we were hoping they would also upgrade would be that the card would not be paper, but it is still extremely, it's extremely light and paper bendable. You can wash it in your washing machine and it washes away. So um, they have not gotten up on the times of that, but it is a paper card. Um, when people are collecting their social securities um, income leading up to 65, they will get this card in the mail three to three and a half months before that 65th birthday if they're collecting. And when they get the card, a lot of times people throw the, the, the packet out because the packet will come to you in the most non-descriptive way. It's just like a white envelope that's about five by six with very important information in it, but people don't realize how important it is. And a lot of times it doesn't scream, this is my Medicare card. Um, it basically gets thrown out a lot of times with all the solicitation. Um, so I always tell my clients, if you are collecting, this card will show up at your home three and a half to three months before that 65th birthday. Um, like clockwork in most cases and be looking for it because it's going to come in a five by six white envelope that looks very, very non-exciting. So that that's one of the biggest um, pieces of advice I can give tonight. If you are collecting, you are getting close to your 65th birthday, be looking for this about three months before. Don't throw it out. It's hard to get. So we have another question. Yes. So uh, the next question is, if I elect not to take Social Security and elect to enroll in Medicare, how does the payment happen? Then you will be billed. So um, if you do not, if you take your Medicare, but you want to wait on that Social Security income till it accrues over time or you're at your full mature rate, they will bill you quarterly for that amount of money. It'll come to you in a billing statement. There's only two ways to pay for it. If you're collecting, it comes out of your check or they bill you quarterly. And that is the one bill that we tell people do not not pay or do not lose because I did have in my career, I've had two people that were traveling. They, you know, the bill was coming in. They weren't paying attention to it and they actually didn't pay their premium in a timely way. And so actually Social Security, Medicare canceled out their Medicare Part B, which then in, they lost their insurance and then they couldn't apply till the next general enrollment period. Um, they still were able to keep the A because the A is free, um, which we're gonna get to in a minute, but the B is not. And um, so they had hospital, but they didn't have medical. 
And so that was, uh, that was awful. And then they incurred a penalty. Um, so that is one bill. If you're going to pay it quarterly, if that's the way it's going to work best for you, do not miss that bill. There we go. Okay. So here we go. So part A. Um, part A, um, basically, you know, all this talk about A and B and, and all this information, what does it all mean? Um, so part A, um, I always tell my clients is given to you. Um, it's, I always say it's like your birthday gift when you're turning 65. Um, and it's the government saying, thank you so much for paying into FICA your entire life. And we are going to give you part A for free. Most people do get part A for free unless they hadn't paid into Medicare a certain amount of quarters. Um, but most people do get the A for free. And the A is going to cover 80% of your inpatient hospital services, skilled nursing facility services, once again, 80%, home health care and hospice care. So if you were somebody that said, you know what, all I'm doing is part A, that's it, that's all I'm going to do. And I'm not going to do any other insurance. And you walked into a hospital, you would have 80% coverage. That's great. It's scary though, because we know that 20% left over could be financially crippling if people don't have more than part A, but you are automatically given the part A for no extra cost. The part B um, covered services is the 80% as well for everything that happens outside of the hospital setting medically. So the Part B is going to cover 80% of your doctors and physicians, specialty, speech and therapy, ambulance, and all the things that you see on that, um, medical expenses. Home health care, um, it'll take care of part-time uh, nursing home skilled care, home health care aides, physical, occupational therapy, speech and language therapies as well. Um, any kind of outpatient hospital services like outpatient surgeries, diagnostic procedures, emergency room, partial hospitalizations, that also is covered under Medicare Part B, 80%, and then durable medical equipment, um, walkers, wheelchairs, hospital beds, insulin, um, some medications, um, you know, big medications would be covered under Part B, not at the drugstore. Um, and that's another big thing that Part B um, covers and Part B is not free. And so that's where this next slide um, definitely gets people a little sideways. You know, I, I cannot tell you in, in how many years I've been doing this, probably the, the most shocking thing to people, for people that have really not dived into Medicare and, and really researching things before they sit down or get to that point, and, and a lot of people don't. But what's the most interesting part I'd say about my job is how many people do not realize that Medicare comes at a cost. The Part B side is not free. And it is so sad for people that have worked their entire lives and then they see these numbers and they're like, are you kidding me? You know, I thought Medicare was going to be free. Um, I thought Medicare was going to be less than this. And when I started 20 some years ago, um, Medicare was $47 a month. Um, and it didn't matter what your income was, it was $47 a month. And then, um, prog you know, progression has taken over. And um, then, like every four years, we would see an increase in the Medicare premiums. And then all of a sudden, I think it was in 2006, um, we saw a yearly income figure where depending on somebody's income, which is in front of us right now, um, whether you file jointly or separate or single, um, there is an amount of money that depending on what you file back two years, they look at your um, modified adjusted gross income is how they determine what your Medicare premiums are going to be. And this is very, very important. This is probably one of the most important things I feel for people that are prepping for retirement and knowing is, you know, they look back two years, at least they do today. Um, you know, we all know things can change, but as of today, they look back two years at your modified adjusted gross income. So people filing in 2022 for Medicare, they're looking at your income in 2020. And in a financial plan for retirement, this is super, super important to know so we can plan accordingly and, and, and also help when making health insurance decisions in Medicare, what the cost is really going to be. Um, it's never my business what people make. Um, I, I don't ask these questions to get into personal things, but I make sure they see this chart so they can sit back and say, okay, this is probably what it's going to cost me for Part B. Um, 
the one thing at this time of the year that is interesting is we're in we're in my I'm in my annual enrollment period starting this week, um, which is where anybody in Medicare can make changes to their plan starting um, October 15th. And we've had to go through a ton of training and um, a lot of things to get to this point. But the one thing and Mike knows this every year we talk about it. Um, when I do this presentation is we do not yet know what next year's Medicare Part B rates are going to be. So even though we're talking about plans for next year already, we can't tell you what that final number is going to be. I was told, and a lot of people on this um, presentation tonight might have read it too, that it's supposed to go down a little bit next year, um, but we are going to wait and see that. I won't believe it until I see it in black and white, which I'm thinking will probably be a few more weeks till we find out. But for right now, anybody um, retiring this year, um, this is the sliding scale that we look at. The average premium um, is $170.10 a month. Um, and you can see on the slides, you know, whether somebody's filing individually, the income they're going by, filing jointly or filing married and separate tax returns. Um, and then it can go down as much as $578.30. So think about this, you know, you've got the A and the B, you think about a circle filled 80%. So 80% Medicare is going to pick up of that circle at the cost of this. So when we're making insurance decisions, we have to make, make sure people know Medicare is going to cost this. And then we're going to have to most likely give you insurance and medical prescription coverage on top of that. So that's why these numbers are so imperative to people's making people making really good decisions with retirement and where they are at financially and also choosing health insurance, what they can afford. Okay. So this is gonna go back to that original question that we had a little bit ago on um, paying the Part B premium. You know, how is it paid? Um, it is taken out of the monthly social security payment. Um, if you're not receiving that income, you will be billed every three months quarterly for that. Um, once again, that is the one bill in your life that you do not want to miss. Um, there, I don't want people to look at the slideshow tonight and feel discouraged either, you know, feel discouraged about the numbers and, and, and the cost of Medicare, because if somebody does have a lower income, um, there is a lot of low income subsidies out there um, to help you pay for your Medicare Part B premium in Medicare. Um, so initially, you know, we have the ability to help people apply for the, it's called the Medicare Savings Program, um, where people, if they fall under a certain income requirement, will qualify to have that Medicare premium paid for. Um, we also have this year, which I've added to this slideshow more than ever, and, and if anybody's been paying attention to the commercials, this is one of the big things that was happening this year and for next year is a lot of our Medicare Advantage plans, which I'll explain what those are further into the presentation, are also offering with different companies, they will also help pay for your Medicare premiums. There's some plans that are giving subsidies towards those premiums if you choose those plans. Um, so we tell people to be careful with that, you know, make sure, you know, we're not just choosing the plan to get that extra help in that Medicare premium. We're making sure you check the plan for everything, your doctors, your meds, co-pays, but it is a nice little perk if you just cho do choose a plan that seems to fit your needs to also have that Medicare premium, some of it at least reimbursed. And with the Medicare Advantage plans, um, some of them aren't looking at financials to get that reimbursement. Some do look at your financials to get the reimbursement, but some do not. So it not always is related to the income either that you're making. Okay. So this, I, I would say, is probably my most um, important slide to make sure people understand, especially when they're getting closer to making health insurance choices, choices in Medicare. Because this slide really, when we're in that position of getting ready to make a choice, um, people are extremely overwhelmed because there is so many choices out there. Um, this year, there is about 67 different options in 2022 for health insurance. Next year in 2023, I think I was told there was like 53. So it is, it is crazy and massive and confusing for a lot of people. But what I tell people, you know, 
throwing 60 some plans or 50 some plans in front of a family or an individual when we're meeting with them is not what we need to do. What we need to do more than importantly, and this is why we do these presentations, and this is why we want to be in front of people to educate them, is to understand what you're choosing. It, what are these 57 plans? What does the term Medicare Advantage mean that I said a minute ago? What is a Medicare supplement? And unless you really know what those two things are, I really believe you cannot make the most well-informed decision for you. It is so imperative that you understand what a true Medicare Advantage is, what a Medicare supplement is, because in order to really choose right, you really need to know the difference. And so this slide, I've used it for years. Um, it's come in all different shapes and sizes, but this slide is one that um, even when I sit down with clients to this day in their portfolios that I give them, they have this sheet and I go over the sheet in detail, no matter what insurance they choose. Um, because it's very sad for me when I see clients come in who've been on Medicare already and they come in with questions and they never knew the difference of what an Advantage plan is versus a supplement. So if you could take away from anything today, um, all the information we share is very important, but this, one, this particular slide is also really helpful with navigating Medicare. And so initially, um, when we look at this, we're going to see two different sides. Um, we're going to see original Medicare, and then we're going to see Medicare Advantage. What does that mean? So if we took all 50-some plans and we put them in this room right now, we would separate them into two categories, the Advantage side and the Medicare supplement. Another term for a Medicare supplement is Medigap, means the exact same thing. Medicare Advantage plans basically are developed to be uh, all-inclusive products. It includes your medical doctors, your prescriptions, um, gym memberships, eyeglass benefits in most cases, sometimes some dental. Um, it's an all-inclusive product that is wrapped up into a pretty little box with a bow. And why it's called a Medicare Advantage is because with those types of plans, which used to be called HMOs and PPOs, and they're still called that today, um, HMOs and PPOs are our Medicare Advantage plans, um, but a Medicare Advantage means that if you go that route and you went through all the trouble to get on Medicare and you're paying for Medicare, that Medicare Advantage is your primary. Medicare A and B is secondary. So when you go to the doctors and you give them your health insurance, you have a Medicare Advantage plan, you're going to show that card first, and Medicare is secondary. That's why it's called a Medicare Advantage. Back before 2006, anybody in Medicare, you could have an HMO, a PPO, a Medicare supplement, group insurance. If you had Medicare, Medicare on all plans was primary. But in 2006, when Part D came to the picture, came out, we were so excited because when I started doing um, my job back in the day, there was no drug coverage. There's no Part D. You either had group insurance that would cover it or Medicaid and Epic. Um, but people retiring and they'd be like, OK, I'm going to retire, Tammy. This is my list of meds. And I'd say, oh, my goodness, did you already leave your job? Because there's no there's no drug coverage in Medicare um, unless you have low income. So when Part D came to the table in 2006, for me, I, I can't even begin to explain how special that was because I knew people then retiring would finally have drug coverage in their plans away from group. But what it did was the government said, OK, we're going to change the insurance industry forever and we're going to develop these programs called Medicare Advantage. And we're going to take these HMOs and PPOs where Medicare used to be first and now we're going to make it second and we're going to have the health insurance calling the shots. They're going to be primary. And these insurance companies were like, well, wait a minute, what's in it for me? Like, I don't want to be primary. I don't want to have to pay 80% of claims and the insurance and the government said, don't worry, we're going to financially induce your plan. So these plans, when you see Medicare Advantage, um, you're going to see a lot of fluff. Like I said, the dental, the gym, the sometimes, like I said, getting the extra benefits on the Medicare premium because they're being financially induced by the government to keep the premiums low. We have premiums out there that are lower and then we have some Advantage plans that are a little bit more expensive but they're all inclusive and they're designed to have Medicare second and the insurance company first. 
The thing about Medicare Advantage I can share with my with you tonight that I always tell my clients if you're working um, on your insurance decisions on your own and you want to you know navigate the um, Medicare world on your own and look into things on your own, the one thing you want to pay close attention to is don't let these commercials get to you. Don't let all the fluff that they're talking about really, you know, you know, encourage you to jump into a plan because you're going to get a silver sneakers benefit, which is a good thing. But sometimes it's not always the best thing. You want to make sure when you're looking at Medicare Advantage plans that you're making sure that the doctors you go to, the hospitals that are important to you, your prescriptions are huge to make sure that these doctors are in network with that plan, that your prescriptions are on the formularies of these Medicare Advantage plans, because that's where people get really turned around. They hear on the news or these great plans or their best friend has a plan and they just kind of put their blinders on and they're overwhelmed and they jump into a Medicare Advantage because their friend did it and come to find out the doctors they go to or some of their medications aren't on the list. And that can be a real issue. So Medicare Advantage is awesome. It's super popular in this area. Um, they're very, very televised. They're very marketed. Um, but we always tell our clients, make sure, you know, when people sit down with me, the first questions I ask is not to be nosy, but to say, I want to know your doctors. I want to know what's important to you. Do you travel? You know, um, if you're a traveler, there's certain plans that are going to cover you for travel better than others. And if you're leaning towards an advantage, we have to make sure that your doctors, your hospitals, your medications are on the list of that plan. Um, and so that's where we help people coordinate their benefits every day. So Medicare Advantage, once again, in a nutshell, the takeaway is they're, they're a lower premium plan primarily. Um, they're an all-inclusive plan with medical and prescriptions included. Um, and then Medicare is secondary. You must have A and B to have them, um, but your insurance company is primary. Whatever you choose is primary. So make sure you check your doctors to make sure they work with that plan. So on the other side of the screen, you're gonna see original Medicare. That is, once again, the Medicare supplement side or the Medigap side. Um, these plans are also very, very different. Um, when, we, when people say, oh, I have a Medicare Advantage, it's the same as a Medigap or a supplement. No, no, no. It's like comparing an apple to an orange. Um, a Medicare supplement is different because Medicare is your primary. So when somebody does a Medicare supplement, Medicare is who that doctor is billing first, part A and part B. Part A and part B are covering 80% of that bill, and then the remainder goes over to the Medigap policy, and they pick up the remainder of that bill. Some plans will pick up basically 100% of the 20% left over. Uh, some plans will have a little copay of like $20 to primary, $20 to specialist, $50 to ER. Um, but primarily, um, they are Medicare first. The remainder, the 20%, goes over to the supplement. All supplements are standardized in New York State. That basically means there's multiple companies to choose from with supplements as well, but they all must be the same. The only difference is premiums. Some are higher, some are lower. So Medigap policies are standardized. They're all the same in most states across the nation. Um, they all offer the same benefits, but where people may shop the market is on the price from area to area can waver. Um, supplements, a lot of people that are drawn to them are big travelers, um, people that are snowbirds. Um, it's not that the advantage plans don't cover for travel, but with the supplements, there's no network. You know, you basically go anywhere nationally as long as um, the facility is willing to bill Medicare, which is usually never an issue. Um, it's never an issue to use the plan nationally. Um, for people that are out of the service area for more than six months, you know, the snowbirds, or they have doctors that they frequent in a different state, um, having Medicare as your primary makes it very easy because Medicare is national. Um, the thing about the supplements that sometimes people don't love are the fact that there is not usually a gym membership associated with them. Some companies do offer that perk, some do not with supplements, and there's no dental. Um, they don't give that extra fluff that the Advantage plans do. They're more about giving the, the national footprint and the medical. Um, the other thing that makes them different is the Medicare Part D drug plan is separate. So um, when it comes to people wanting supplements, when I work with them, it is extremely important that we also take their prescription list. 
um, because uh, in New York state, there's 19 different drug plans we can give you with a supplement. Um, and my job and what I make my job is to make sure my clients don't only walk away with health insurance, but obviously, you know, drug coverage too. So we really take a look at the meds. Um, I take that very, very seriously um, because prescriptions more than ever are so expensive. Um, I know that there has been some bills passed. I'm sure you've all read about it. It's been a very common thing in, in the paper and they're in, it's continuing to see to get better in the nearest to future, but prescriptions now specifically insulin, they finally kind of gotten that under control um, in Medicare, which is super important to keep co-pays under $35 on most plans, um, whether it's an Advantage plan or a standalone Part D. Um, prescriptions are probably the biggest part of my day is running people's meds. So when we have somebody with a Medicare supplement that they're interested in, um, we, we take that very serious and we look at there's about 19 different Part D drug plans that we look at to make sure our clients are getting the most appropriate drug plan. Um, and we look at that every year. So every year we send a letter, we ask our clients to reach out to us to let us know if there's been med changes, doctor changes, et cetera. And those are the things that we check on every year for our clients. Okay, a few couple little um, other things about Medicare supplements that I might have already said, but I'm just going to re, um, reiterate um, the medic. What is a Medicare supplement? Again, remember Medicare is primary with them. Um, they are provided by private health insurance companies. Um, we call them also original Medicare plans. You must have both parts A and part B to have a Medicare supplement. It's not one or the other. You have to have both. Medicare pays primary. So remember Medicare Part A hospital, Part B medical, 80% of the bills are going against Medicare first. And then it covers the, the Medicare supplement will cover the major gaps in Medicare and the Medicare approved charges. This is an important little bullet point here is the Medicare approved charges. This is something when we do deal with Medicare supplements, we have to make sure that people know that um, if they're going for a procedure, it has to be coded to Medicare's liking and that it's medically necessary. If you get a procedure and it wasn't medically necessary or it wasn't coded correctly to, the, to Medicare, Medicare will not pay it, neither will the supplement. So some people think, well, if Medicare denies it, the supplement will turn pay for it. No, they go by what Medicare does, the supplements do. So if your Medicare doesn't pay for a claim, which is unusual, um, that something's not coded appropriately. Um, but if you're, if the Medicare doesn't pay for it, then the Medigap won't either. Um, all policies, as I mentioned, are standardized. Each policy will be identical from company to company, but premiums most mo monthly may vary um, from company to company, except in Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Got a couple of questions yes. here, Tammy. Okay. Yeah, yes. Okay, so uh, first question, if I choose a Medicare Advantage plan initially, can I change to traditional Medicare later if I want? Yes, you can, absolutely. So if um, actually what we're heading into, um, like I said earlier this week, starting October 15th is in New York. Now I'm gonna say this, it depends on the state you're in. So if this individual is in New York state, <clears throat> Um, then that's not an issue. So if you are on a Medicare Advantage and we are between the times of the year of October 15th through December 7th, which is the annual enrollment period for everybody nationally, I'm just gonna talk New York State though right now with this good question. If you are in New York State and you have an Advantage and you wanna now switch over to a supplement, you can absolutely do that. We do not do any medical underwriting in New York State. So if you're on an advantage and you're ready to switch over to the supplement, you can do that between October 15th and December 7th for a start date of January 1. Then in New York State as well, um, we have another open enrollment time, which is what OEP, that actually starts January 1 through March 31st. And you could be in an advantage and go to a supplement, original Medicare, still at that time frame of the year. Or some people, especially during this last part of the year, we're dealing with holidays, right? A lot of people say, I'm not worried about my insurance. It's great. I'm happy. 
I'm, I'm not going to change anything. They don't pay attention to their mail. And then all of a sudden, the new year comes around and they find out when they go to the doctors the first time, there was a copay change. There was an increase. There was a medication that they used to take that is not on the formula anymore. So Advantage plan people can go from a like advantage to another advantage during January 1 through March 31st. Or once again, they can go from an advantage to a supplement. After March 31st in New York State, <clears throat> there is a little bit of gray area. Um, it depends though. Um, it, it, some people will call me. I, and sadly, actually, I get probably about three calls a month where people need to change their plan for various reasons. They want to go to a supplement. Um, at that point, um, if they're over 65, um, and they need to make an adjustment or want to make an adjustment, we can do it. They can go from an advantage to a supplement if they qualify in New York State for EPIC. Um, EPIC is a New York State pharmaceutical assistance program that most people take to have help on their meds when they're over 65, but it also allows us to make a health insurance change too. So you can go during that time if you qualify um, Epic is financially, um, it's a means, means test. So individuals that make a change, individuals that are single, if your income is under 85,000 a year, you can do Epic and make a change to your health insurance. Um, if you are a couple, if you're under a hundred thousand dollars a year, you can still make a change to your health insurance outside of those two windows we originally talked about. Um, and that once again is between March 31st and the end of the year. Um, but they do a means test and it just depends on your income if you can change again. Um, I say New York State because in New York State, the one good thing going for us here, other than the bills and great food, um, is our health insurance is actually pretty awesome in the sense that we can make health insurance changes at these times without medical questions asked. So if we were, you were asking me that question and you were a floor, I'm going to use Florida. If Florida is not the only state that does this. There's many states, Virginia, there's other states that do medical underwriting for supplements. Um, I'm just going to talk Florida right now because it's the most, most common place that people may change residence to. Um, but in Florida, if you were to ask me that question, I knew you were a Florida resident. If you are on Medicare Advantage and you are six months past being new to Medicare, so you're outside of the six month window of being new to Medicare. And you said, you know what, during open enrollment or annual enrollment, I'm going to switch up to a supplement. And there is then medical underwriting questions. And if you said yes to any of these medical underwriting questions, you then would most likely be denied to go to a supplement in certain states. And that is once again, if you're not if you're not new to Medicare and it's six months being past new to Medicare, then you could have an issue changing to a supplement. Um, I'm going to give you a case that just came to me this year. I had a woman who was um, in her 70s, so she was past 65. Um, her husband had passed away. They actually had group insurance through New York State, but they had changed their residence and lived in Florida. When he had passed away, sadly her group insurance ended the day of his death. Um, she actually was referred to me through a, a physician's office and waited a few months to call me. But it wouldn't have mattered because when she did call me, remember she was in her 70s, um, she wanted something like a supplement. And so I told her, I said, okay, you reside in Florida. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask you some medical questions that were on the application. And to be honest with you, she actually answered no to everything. She answered no. She, there was nothing, and she wasn't hiding anything. There was nothing that on the questions that she asked came out as a yes. So we submitted the application. Everything seemed fine until um, we were notified that when they when you submit in those states that there's medical underwriting with supplements, they check the Medicare, um, the Medical Information Bureau. And back two years ago, she was given a prescription that she actually had never filled for, um, they had thought maybe she was having a cardiac issue, um, but it was just a panic attack. 
And believe it or not, the application was thrown out because they went back and checked to see if there was anything in her history. And it actually came up and she was denied and we could not get her on a Medicare supplement. And, and she's like, well, if I go to a different company that's a Medicare supplement in the state of Florida, well, do you think it'll be okay? And, and no. So as soon as you're denied in the state of, and this is in the state of Florida, but it wouldn't have mattered. Any other state that has medical underwriting would have kicked it out. So that is for people that are going to change residents. We always tell them, you know, think about that, you know, maybe do a Medicare supplement before you leave. Um, if you think in the future, you might want one um, when you're in New York state before you move. Um, so just a little food for thought, but that's a really great question. A long answer. Okay. Long answer to a great question. Uh, very good. Uh, question number two, is there a policy that covers home health aids other than post-surgery related? So that is, out, okay, so there used to be, um, I don't work in the long-term care, um, I used to. I used to do policies that were like life policies and long-term care with home care riders. And back in the day, there was a policy that you could purchase just for home care. Um, I have not seen one since. Um, I, I think maybe, Mike, you might be in more of the avenue to answer that question, but in Medicare, in my world, no. That is a separate policy usually given through a long-term care company, um, but um, not in the Medicare world, only after following a hospital stay, as you obviously must know. Any more questions, Mike? Nothing, nothing yet. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to switch out of the Medicare supplements um, and just a little bit more um, information on Medicare Advantage. Some of the things, like I said before, I've already spoken of, but I like to make sure one of the takeaways is that understanding the difference between supplements versus Advantage. Um, so once again, Medicare Advantage plans are part C. We got the A, hospital, B, medical, C is Medicare Advantage or once again, an HMO or PPO. Uh, Medicare Advantage plans um, basically cover all Medicare services sponsored by private health insurance companies. Medicare Advantage plans may also offer extra coverage. So all the fluff, I like to refer to it as fluff. For example, gym memberships, eyeglasses, dental cleanings. Now we're talking about some help on the Medicare premiums for some people. We have some plans go as far as give transportation, Lots of things. A lot of the Medicare Advantage plans are designed to be able to give some extra fluff, and that's what they do. Um, drug coverage and Medicare Advantage plans. You cannot have a standalone drug plan and a Medicare Advantage plan. If you're in a Medicare Advantage plan that includes drug coverage and you join a standalone Medicare prescription drug plan, you will be disenrolled from your Medicare Advantage plan and return forcibly to original Medicare. What does that mean? Great example of this is back when Part D came out, Part D, once again, there's different formularies with different companies and that just covers drugs. But people might have been on an HMO or PPO Medicare Advantage, but they love the health insurance, but they didn't think all their drugs or they didn't, all their drugs weren't on that Medicare Advantage plan. So they'd say, well, guess what? I'm going to choose this stand. I'm not allowed to name companies, but I'm just going to say, I'm going to choose a standalone drug plan to take care of my meds that my Medicare Advantage doesn't. And actually in 2006, when Part D came out, there was a facility taking care of retirees that was saying, oh yeah, you can do that. Not realizing that the second that individual signed up for a standalone Part D, it cancels out their Medicare Advantage. So the point is, it's one or the other. You can't just say, oh, this drug plan looks great. I want this one, but I'm gonna keep my Medicare Advantage that includes drugs. You can't do that. Um, not to make it confusing, there is some plans out there in Medicare Advantage, specifically I'll name one, it's called a private fee for service. Private fee for service plans, if you've done any research, you would see them. There is, they are available in our county here in Erie and Niagara in our Western New York counties. Um, there is certain private fee for service plans that will allow you to take a standalone drug plan, but you want to make sure you know what you're signing up for. 
education is everything when it comes to this kind of stuff. So that's the one thing that's real important is, you know, make sure you know what drugs are on your formulary. So you feel like you've got the full package. Real quick, Tammy, and this yes. question, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. So uh, the question was, does your, is your office available to discuss Medicare and do you charge a fee for that discussion? I'm assuming I know for level, we don't charge obviously to have a discussion about Medicare, yes. um, but I'm assuming the same is true for you. Same is true for me. So I, I work with people with Medicare every single day. Um, I educate people with Medicare every single day. And I can help people, you know, decide on plans if that's what it goes to in that journey of Medicare. But we are not, when I work with Medicare eligibles, we are not allowed to charge a fee. It's actually against the law. Um, so there is no consultation fees ever. I do, I've done consultations forever. Never, ever have charged a fee. We're not allowed to, but that's a great question. And I, I do get that answer or question all the time. And I tell people, don't worry, my kids eat very well. My kids will still eat there is no consultation fee. So it's what we do. It's exactly what we do every day. Okay, so drug formulary. Um, this is just a touch on the part D. So we talked about the A, the B, the C. Um, once again, remember mo most Medicare Advantage plans will include the drug coverage, the part D, but some people you know, choose a, a standalone part D for many reasons. And um, looking at prescription plans, looking at Part D, important concepts is the formulary, the list of drugs that the insurance plan covers. So we can have this great plan, sounds fabulous, but if your medications are not on the list, we are going to have a real problem. Medicare provides guidelines about the types of drugs to be covered, but not that specific drug. So every um, drug company, every formulary, um, any, any plan, they will have specific drug guidelines that they have to follow. Like for example, if there's, they have, they have to have a diabetes category, they have to cover specific amounts of diabetes drugs in their formulary. There's criteria. Each plan will though have a different formulary. So, you know, one of the parts of my job is research. You know, when people come to me and we're trying to help them find the most appropriate plan, that research is what we do is we check every single formulary. We have a tool that we use to plug in your meds and it will spit back to me the top companies to cover your meds. And then we look at the deductibles, the co-pays, the pharmacies that are preferred or standard. That's a big one, you know, um, especially going into 2023. The one thing I've noticed with the difference from this year to next year, sadly, is the pharmacies now have come, they're, they're pushing away from the small mom and pop pharmacies. They're making, you can still go there, but you're going to pay more. They're pushing now more of the big pharmacies to get lower rates. Express scripts, um, you know, some of these mail order programs, to give an example. Um, which for some people is wonderful. But we're seeing that the pharmacies now are really important on making sure you're choosing the right plan, you know, due to the pharmacy you go to. So those are the things that we look at. Um, Medicare has excluded some types of drugs, but some plans may include them as part of an enhanced formulary. So like some of the drugs that might not be included are cosmetic drugs, things like that. Medicare Part D and the coverage gap or the donut hole. Um, Medicare Part D, I would say one of the biggest things um, people are aware of or have heard about is that donut hole. Um, this slide shows this year's Medicare donut hole or Medicare explanation of Part D for 2022. Um, this formula, this slide, all insurance companies, all drug coverage must follow this guideline. They all must follow the guideline, but some plans have different deductibles. Some are bigger, some are smaller in the, in the initial deductible phase. Some have waived the deductible. But the one thing that has not changed is this donor hole or the coverage gap. So the best way to explain it, I, this is probably where people kind of look at me with 10 heads because it is a little confusing. And um, to explain it sometimes can be really hard. But I always tell my clients, and, and I'm going to talk calendar year because I think sometimes it's a little easier to understand the amounts when we're dealing with calendar year. So I always explain it this way. 
you know, every year, if you, you go into a drug plan through Medicare, in the beginning of this year, you're starting out with 4430 so $4,430. I always say, like, picture an ATM. When you start out in January, you have an ATM full of $4,400. Next year, it's going up a little bit to $4,660. But this year, it's $4,430. So you start out, you're ready to go, and you go fill your first prescription. And that first prescription retails for a hundred bucks, but your copay under your plan is 40. So some people think, okay, well, they're taking, when I fill my med and I got my little ATM full of money of 4,400 bucks, they're only taking $40 off of that 4430. No, they're taking the difference of the retail cost minus your copay. $60 off of that $4,400. So for people that come to me that are on generics, low cost meds, they may never see the, they may never come out of that initial enrollment or that initial part of the donut hole. But some people that are on inhalers or, you know, certain blood thinners, you know, their copay might be 40 bucks but the cost of the drug could be 500 retail. So 460 is coming off of this 4,400 and I think you get it. So when people, when we look and we advise and we try to forecast for them, there's some of my clients that actually get to this 4430 fast. And over the years, up until last year, my clients that had insulin, I cannot begin to explain to you how horrible it was for them because they would get to this 4,400 very fast. And then they would go into the donut hole, um, the coverage gap part where you'll see pays 25% of the retail cost of a higher cost brand name drug, 25% of insulin. Are you kidding me? It, it can be outrageous. So finally last year was my first annual enrollment period a year ago now where we, I think it was last year where we were preparing to tell people certain insulins now are gonna be capped at $35 for the whole year. So you don't have to worry about falling in the donut hole if you take insulin. That is such a big deal. And from what we understand, it's gonna get better and better every year. Um, so I know most of the insulins, I believe all of them we were told um, for 2023 are gonna be capped at like around $35 for next year. People aren't gonna have to worry about that donut hole, but some meds, do still put people in the donor hole. So once again, um, with the initial part, you, you start out with this bank of money in the beginning of the year or whenever you're coming into Medicare and it's full, but every time you fill that drug, it's taking out the difference against that 4430. So some people then fall into the donut hole and then they're responsible for 25%. That sometimes is where we try to help people get epic um, which is, I mentioned before, the New York State Pharmaceutical Assistance Program depends on your income, but some people, that's why we get them on Epic to help pay for those co-pays in the coverage gap. Some people qualify for what we call low-income subsidy, LIS, where they qualify for some partial Medicaid help on their prescriptions, and we have the ability to help you get those. We try, and even when people, I will say this too, I meant to say this earlier, when people are becoming Medicare eligible and they're getting some of the forms in the mail, you will get a form about qualifying for extra help. And, and some people get leery on filling out this form and it actually comes from social security. So it is a legal document. Um, and so you, you pretty much, it comes with your Medicare information and it's requesting if you choose to fill it out to see if you qualify for extra help, to help on that Medicare premium, to help on your meds. And um, there is a lot of help. So we really try to help people not get discouraged. Um, I cannot tell you, believe it or not, um, for a lot of my clients that fall into the donut hole that don't qualify for Epic or some extra help, they are going to Canada. Um, there's a lot of mail order Canada programs out there that I know with the borders being closed for as long as they were, had changed a lot for people, but um, we had people going over the border pre-COVID, and then we got people now ordering some things um, online and getting prescriptions, um, lots of inhalers actually for a lot lower cost if they found the donut hole. Um, is there a, is there a, 
an end in sight though with the donor hole. I don't, I know that in 2025, there's some talk about capping um, people's out-of-pocket maximum on drugs at 2000. Um, once again, we wait and we see. What we know is what we know today. We know things have gotten much better, so much better on the insulin. And there has been a lot of extra help given along the way. Um, for somebody that falls in the donut hole, there is a chance that they could get to the other side of it, especially if they're on injectable type of medications that are very expensive, some biologics, cancer medications. Some people go into the coverage gap and then they get to the other side, which is called, called catastrophic. And with that, they have to um, get to 7,050 to get to catastrophic. It is the difference between the initial and so 4430 minus 7,050 uh, 7, is what brings you to the catastrophic side. So what does that basically mean? When you fall into the donut hole, it doesn't start over again at dollar one. They're still adding up from the 4430. So if you fall in the donut hole, and as you're in the donut hole, you're still getting your meds, obviously, and you get to 7,050 in that, in that part of the year, then you go to catastrophic. And then your meds will be either 5%, $3.70 or 920. So do I have clients get to catastrophic? Yes, I do. Um, and then it resets again every January. So we're, we're getting to that later part of the year right now where people are, um, some of my clients are just falling into the coverage gap. And I tell them, listen, we're so close to the end. Call your doctor, see if he can give you samples. There's a lot of tricks to this. You know, we, we help people and hold their hands with this every day. Um, so a lot of my clients that get close to this time of the year, even one sample from the doctor can get them to the next year where it starts up all, all over again. Okay, so um, just like part B, if you don't take it when you're eligible, part D also, if you don't take it when you're eligible, remember you may owe a late enrollment penalty if you went 63 days from your initial enrollment period or goes over without a Part D drug plan or credible drug coverage over a certain amount of time. So what does that basically mean in a nutshell? Is in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about when you're new to Medicare coming away from group insurance or turning 65, 63 days is the date for they, the government expects you to take a Part D. So if you don't take from when you're new to Medicare, a drug plan, even if you take no drugs at all, sounds crazy, but if you don't take anything to cover your meds, but after 63 days of being new to Medicare, you will incur a 1% penalty per month for every month that you do not have a drug plan in place. And the penalty will stay indefinitely, just like if you don't take Part B. Um, how frustrating for people that don't take any meds. <laughs> I get this every day, you know, Tammy, I don't take a, a, a med, I'm into vitamins, nutrition, a holistic, whatever it is. Um, but I tell them the rules, what they do with the rules is up to them, but we do encourage them to at least take something. Um, for my clients that, um, you know, don't take a drug plan, we try to give them the lowest Part D out there just to protect them from the penalty, even if they never use the drug plan. And you know what, who's to say, you know, we all know here, we all know sadly that, you know, in one day things can change. So it's nice to know you have a little something for a backup. That's why we take insurance um, just in case we need it. So it's good to always have the Part D just in case you need it. So Medicare versus group. Um, timing, I think you folks are seeing that on this presentation today. Timing is everything. Um, when you are leading up to Medicare, even if you're still working or thinking about retiring, starting the journey early is where it's at if you can help it. So about four to six months before you anticipate enrolling in Medicare, it really is helpful um, to get that, you know, those questions asked to think about what you want to do. Um, you would contact me as soon as possible, um, as soon as you're ready to retire or thinking about retirement. Because once again, a lot of things, you know, people don't realize they may have to do, we may have to do. Um, and it's, in, it's important if you can control it to start it early. Now, um, during the last three years, people have 
left their jobs, lost their jobs, been furloughed, all different things. And sometimes, we, you know, especially in the last three years, we couldn't sometimes anticipate, you know, what we were going to, what was going to happen tomorrow. But um, were we able to help those people without seeing them six months before? Absolutely. We help people that have lost their insurance um, and need Medicare within two weeks. Do we make it happen? We do. We try. Um, but it's always great to start that process early. Um, it's very important. I think, you know, you could tell today, um, you know, reviewing of your personal situation is key to making the right decisions for you personally. So daily medications, doctors, travel, um, just what your personal needs are will help you make the best decision for you. Um, will help you compare the plans offered in Medicare within your state and county. Um, I, most of my days um, are spent with people that are still working and they have group insurance, um, all different types of people, but a lot of my day is spent with those people still working, they're anticipating, they're turning 65 or anticipating retirement, and they just don't really know. You know, they don't, they're afraid to say something to their employer because they don't really know what's available to them in Medicare. And, you know, we bring them in, we kind of show them the lay of the land, you know, what Medicare will look like if they, they go on Medicare now versus their group plan. We look at that, we encourage them to bring their group benefits with them. And we look at what the group is offering and we compare it to what Medicare has. So they have a better understanding of what it might look for them when they're ready to retire. And it gives them a sense of peace without wondering before they say the words, I'm ready to retire. So we, I spend a lot of my day doing that um, with clients um, often. Um, I will complete a Medicare review to allow you to plan better for your retirement and be better prepared for that transition financially. You know, we, I saw a lady yesterday that's not really thinking about retiring until 2024, but just the commercials and the stress of it and just not sure about how much her prescription specifically were gonna cost. I know that can change from now to then, but just to give her a little bit of planning and um, cost was really, really beneficial to her. She felt really good when she left. Okay, so Medicare, once again, versus group a little bit more. In some circumstances, when making decisions, I'm choosing Medicare. A spouse that is younger than 65 will absolutely pay, play a big part in Medicare decision making. So I always tell my clients you know, that it actually the spouse is always probably the most complicated part, because if they're younger, if there's children still living at home and you're covering, we're always looking into your group option or COBRA for a younger spouse and comparing it to also the New York State Exchange plans offered um, as well is a very good idea. So when we do have a younger spouse, um, we, we, we will always encourage them to look, you know, obviously at their group plan, believe it or not, sometimes group plans will surprise you and cover you great into retirement. Or, you know, if you retire and we've got a younger spouse or children, even though COBRA can be expensive, sometimes that's the best way to go. But then there also is the New York State plans as well that we also encourage people to take a look at. Um, the Sable Agency will make sure we help you explore all your options so you can make the best, most well-informed decision for your whole family. Here is the slide um, that we're in right now. I'm going back to, can I change in New York State? Remember, can we change plans um, at, to any kind of plan? Um, can you go from a supplement to an advantage, an advantage to a supplement? You can do that every year during, in New York State between October 15th and December 7th. Um, that is what um, we're anticipating for Saturday. Um, that is why my eyes are heavy tonight because there's a lot of anticipation, a lot to do. Um, but we get it done every year and it's a six week window. It seems small um, and it is quick. But like I said, there's another one for the people that do miss the first one, remember, there's another one that begins January 1 through March 31st. That one is a little bit more strict. Um, you can go from one like plan to another. So one advantage plan to a like to another advantage plan or advantage to um, a Medicare supplement, um, but a little bit more restricted on certain things with that time frame. And then some frequently asked questions. Does Medicare offer dental? So Medicare directly Medicare A and B does not offer dental. So Medicare will not cover dental care that you need primarily for your health of your teeth. Some Advantage plans, once again, the Part C, will offer basic dental. Would a husband and wife be on a joint family plan or are they considered to be an individual um, on individual plans once eligible for Medicare? 
a husband and wife must be on separate plans, just like their Medicare, um, their social security income. Even if you're taking a, a spouses that's larger from you or larger than yours, or you are, um, you know, a deceased spouse, however it works out for you individually, you're separate. Your income is going to come out of your Medicare premium is going to come out of your social security personally. Same as your medical insurance. Your medical insurance is separate. You're given two different Medicare numbers. There's no family plans in Medicare and there's no discounted rate too. I get that a lot. Like if me and my wife choose the same plan, is there a family rate? And there is not. So there's no family plans for married couples in Medicare with non-group insurance. Group insurance is different. We're talking direct Medicare plans. Is there any way to avoid the donor holder coverage gap? Um, yes, for the sake of if you qualify for extra help, which has no gap coverage, no donut hole, LIS is another term for that. Um, if you have extra coverage from a state pharmace pharmaceutical assistance program, that is a New York State EPIC. We are once again very lucky in New York State. Um, we do offer EPIC. There's not a lot of other states that do on uh, New York State will do EPIC. Um, we're, one, we're the only state that does EPIC. There's other states that offer some pharmaceutical help, but there is not anything like EPIC. Um, what happens if I move out of state and I'm already on Medicare? Um, this is once again, going back to that question about, you know, if I was to change residencies, um, if you're in a Medicare supplement, that Medicare supplement already in New York state and you transfer to Florida, that can transfer for you. Um, right now I have a family that just transferred from New York state to Arizona. They were able to keep their plan intact, no problem. The rate, they have the option with this company to keep the New York state rate or do the Arizona rate. And when we checked, the Arizona rate was absolutely cheaper. So they ended up just changing to the Arizona rate. Um, so with a Medicare supplement, those are a little bit more portable with moving. If you are on a Medicare Advantage, you have about 63 days once the move, once you make it official with Social Security, um, you know, to absolutely have to change that Medicare Advantage to the new area you're living in, even if it's a different county. You know, in um, for people that go from Erie County to Niagara County, you would think that they're they could keep the plan. Well, sometimes you can't. Um, you will get a letter from the insurance company. Sometimes there's certain plans that you can't. Um, so that's an important thing, even from county to county, it can make a difference. And then we just have some of um, my contact information up here, my email, you know, some people that might feel uncomfortable asking questions or just want to call me um, or email me. Um, this is all my info and then um, my address. And then these are the resources. And that is basically, that is it. So okay, thank great. You, folks. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah, Tammy, thanks a lot. And everybody, just to, uh, just to wrap up real quick, if you do want Tammy to reach out to you, you can also use our text line, 716-727-5047. Text that, you'll get an automated reply, and then we'll have Tammy reach out to you. So Tammy, thank you very much. And thank everybody, you. Thank you so much, folks. All right. Have a great evening. Take care.